Uh, we have our guests who will be joining us virtually this morning to look into um, the gender-based conversations in Aquabum State. Remember that hands have changed. We now have a new first lady in the person of uh, Pastor Mrs. Patience Omoino, who usually we've seen successively the wives of governors take on that office. You know, the responsibility of being guiding lights where gender-based issues are concerned. And um, Mrs. Patience Omoino has also taken on that responsibility. And it's been preliminary activities geared up towards these um, issues. What is the conversation? What are our numbers? What are the steps being taken to make sure that we are not living in more um, zones where gender issues are concerned, Francis? Well, the, the numbers are staggering. They're alarming. The stories are heartbreaking. They literally make you weep and make you ask if we, uh, this category of people who perpetrate this, you know, kind are of level human. of crimes are actually humans. Because um, e even on Monday when we had the Aquibum Gender Based uh, Violence Center kickstart the One Month Awareness Campaign. A baby was brought in, you know, rescued. And, and the story behind that baby was something that, you know, literally brought tears to a lot of people who were around. Mm -hmm. well, let's welcome our guest, Engineer Harrison Hoodham, who is a Programs uh, Director at Youth for Change Initiative, male advocate for gender based violence and uh, a development expert. Good morning, Engineer. Welcome to Rise and Shine. Good morning. All right, how, how are you this morning? Man, I'm doing good. Okay, so you have myself, Francis, there is Uyai, and there is Ime. Together, we'll be firing all you this morning. I hope he has his yeah, shit. Now I want to fire him, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be firing off. <laughs> yeah, we'll be firing you. I mean, you're a male advocate, right? And yeah. we, we are the ones causing this problem that we are talking about. Our gender, let, let me be specific. Now we, our gender, we are the problem that we are talking about predominantly. So, um, first off, let's even start from the basics. Now, Crime of Gender Based Violence Center has been, you know, up and doing from the time of the previous administration. Um, we've seen the likes of um, the chairman, Barrister MMT, very vocal, very passionate, very dedicated, you know. If I were to see the number of, um, you know, offenders that have been put behind bars, Definitely, um, the numbers are very high, but it seems like even the people who have been prosecuted and numbers are not enough to deter people from, you know, still committing this crime. So first, what is the essence of the one month gender based violence awareness as um, kickstarted by the GBB Center, Aquabum State? Yeah, like um, we all know that uh, without being informed, many seems to be deformed. So we are taking this awareness to let people know because some persons are still in the back. We don't know that these are, are coming. Um, you see, you tell some ladies that there are offices we get to report issues like this to, and they tell they are not aware they are preparing for the first time. So this awareness month for us to bring this information closer to the grassroots, if possible, do a door to door campaign mm. telling people to stop violence. And like you said initially, let me point out something you it is our gender issue. No, 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 I just differ. You know why it seems to be um, a male affair that is to me that are usually the perpetrators is because. We, the male, we refuse to speak out. Who would you go talk to? So most times, I, I when I come on programs like this, I encourage the men to also speak out. Because if most of the men should actually speak out, um, I think um, we are, will be saying it seems is our gender <laughs> issue. <laughs> because a whole lot of men go through a lot, yes. Yes, I'm but I'm not actually standing on the side of men this time to say um, it's actually right for them to do X, Y, Z. But I'm trying to say that um, gender-based issue is is all encompassing. Mm -hmm. It affects the male. It affects the women. It also affects the children, and it is worse on the children's side because most times when the two elephants are fighting, the grass actually suffer, which is actually the children. Because you get to see these students have psychological issues, even it affects the academic and the way they actually perform. So it's a, 
a holistic problem. It's, it's, it deals with the entire family. So that's why we are out here this month. We are trying to bring this information to everybody. We're trying to say, please, let's shun violence. No matter how minute it is, let us just shun violence because it doesn't help us in any way. Instead, the appropriate quarters we can actually channel our grievances to. We can, if, if you feel you're actually not, not comfortable with the marriage anymore, you can approach the court instead of using your fist. If you feel, okay, I've been violated in one way or the other, instead of retaliate, you can actually visit the GBV unit in the uh, Ministry of Justice in the Akwaibum State. We are all there, we're welcoming. Even the um, Ministry of uh, Women Affairs, they also have a unit that tackles these issues. So because most of these issues, um, when we say men actually are perpetrators, yes, they do that because at some point, they don't see who to complain to. So they resort to use their fist. And at the end of it, we don't want to start going to what, what brought about this. A deed has been done, so we now focus our attention on the deed. But you know, violence don't just erupt. It trickles from one drop, two drops, before you know it, it had become an ocean. So we are trying this month to create this awareness, letting everybody know that let's shun violence. All right, Engineer um, Harrison, thank you very much. Uh, but for, for clarity's sake, so a whole lot of us will be on the same page because some people might be indulging in this gender-based violence and they don't actually know they are. So I would like you to clearly define for us, probably give us an overview, what do we understand to be gender-based violence? Actually, gender-based violence it is um, any act of, a whole lot of acts because stalking is there. You know, just keep it following somebody, invading someone's privacy, all those things are gender violence too. Eating of women, abuse, even the little thing like um, psycho uh, psychological abuse, like you make them feel inferior of themselves. Maybe you tell a woman, uh, uh, how would I put it? I don't want to use a. Okay, you actually talk down on a woman so much, or a woman talk down on a man so much. You are worthless, you are this. You know, those things play on someone's psychology. It makes that person feel inferior. It makes that person look less of his or herself. All those are violence. Yeah. So violence is not only hitting the person. Violence is not only um, maybe using a um, sharp object, all those things. No, no. Even abuses, words of mouth, can actually is actually gender-based violence. So probably maybe a woman is um, maybe, will I say, too chubby, and you start saying, eh, you, you, all you do is eat our food, yeah, this, yeah, that. Trying to play down on her, uh, on, like body shaming. Mm. It's violence, too. It's violence. So when we want to say violence, it's, we, we should not just limit it to the um, brutality, the physical punch. Let's also look at the emotional damages we cause and a whole lot of it. In, in, That's in terms also of, is a... in, in terms of emotional damage, do we actually have like um, the law against it? Because it's easy for us to persecute that you know you were physically um, abused yes. in one way or the other. But how do we measure emotional abuse, verbal abuse, and all of that? And are there punitive guidelines for such abuses? Yes, there are. In the verb law, it is enshrined there. I think the, uh, an offense for that is a, a, a three years imprisonment with a, an option of fine or both. Because if it's someone like me sitting as the judge, and I, I, I know actually that uh, the emotional part is actually much more uh, mm, um, damaging than the physical abuse. Mm. And I would I, I likely give you both. That's for me. Because I I I am not I'm not a fan to emotional this thing because it plays down on the person. Physical ones get healed, but how do we know if the emotional ones are healed or not? Mm. So for me, I prefer. Um, I even if I'm I'm the judge sitting, I'll give you both. 
Okay, that, that, fine and you're still good moving back. That's very great. Now, as a result of the meeting that we had early on this week um, of shooting the one month campaign, we have seen that the numbers of violent cases in Akwaibom State is actually shoring up. Why are we having that experience? Now, we must know that in terms of peace, Akwaibom State is rated one of the safest and most peaceful, but why are we having issues in man-to-man -man relationship? What do you think is causing the shore up in the numbers? Okay, I think um, the, the, the challenge is actually in advocacy. We've not been doing carrying out enough sensitization because, um, you know, another thing is when you start creating awareness, people start reporting cases. So, Probably these things have existed, but because they were off record, we didn't know the numbers. So now that we have started launching out and saying, no, you have a safe heaven where you can run to and report these cases and then actually the perpetrators will be brought to book. So we start having the records and it now look like, oh, with the numbers compared to... I think the network is in our way. I, I like the perspective that he's bringing to there. Uh, not necessarily that these issues are on the rise, but people are getting more accustomed to reporting these issues. So the, the, the rate at which we saw people report these cases in the last administration where a strong advocacy really started would be different because now people are getting used to the fact that we have offices, we have people who are willing to listen. It's good that uh, we have these things in place, and I'm particularly glad to hear that there is room made for punishments where um, verbal and emotional abuses are concerned. Because, Francis, sometimes if you even look into the workspace, uh, people are damaged you know, entirely because of workplace toxicity. Some people will never be productive where career is concerned because they worked with a person who spoiled their career image and their mindset where work is concerned. So people need to even get used to the fact that, okay, even at the workplace, through your HR and all of that, there is a, there is a way you report these kind of activities at the workplace. Let's give audio to the deputy um, governor who was representing the wife of the governor at the flag of the campaign. I stand here this afternoon to represent a gift to womanhood, to represent a mother in the real sense of a mother, to represent a wife in the true sense of a wife. To represent a woman with a heart of compassion. To represent the mother of a Kwaibom state. I'm talking about the first lady of a Kwaibom state. Pastor, Mrs. Patience, Uma, Ella. I am honored to stand before you today. That's the words of Pastor Mrs. Uma, uh, Patience Uma, not that of Akoni Yarayi. I'm honored to stand before you today as we commence Agenda-Based Violence Awareness Month, a pivotal initiative aimed at confronting one of the most pressing issues in our society today, that's the gender-based violence, GBV. Gender-based violence is not just a violation of human rights, but a devastating public health issue with far-reaching consequences for individuals, families, and communities. 
it robs survivors of their it robs survivors of their dignity, impedes their potentials, and hinders our collective progress. Of course, um, it's, it's, it's a collective responsibility as a people to actually make sure that um, you know, these things are not happening in our environment. Um, we, we start by being responsible for the next person. Like I'd always tell Francis, I had lived in a, a, you know, a facility where I, I had a neighbor who abused his girlfriend. Now, you're not even married to this person. Mm -hmm. You're dating the person and you're ab physically abusing this person and mentally abusing them. And you also have to know that um, abuse goes beyond just the person. I myself, who is witnessing another person being abused, there is a psychological damage that is going on with me. At that point, I remember that I had had, I had a, um, a robbery PTSD. So for every time I hear the baby being hit, that is me afraid in my own room, thinking it's a robbery attack that is starting. So I remember one time, I jostled out of my sleep. I was sleeping and I sprang out of my bed and ran to the next flat. So that's, so we're talking about the psychological effects of the, not just damaging the person that is being abused, but the, all the, the observers. And just like our guest was saying this morning, the children who are the grass, who are witnessing these abuses, and you realize that this is how some people now grow up to become abusers themselves because they grew up in very abusive environments. I, you know, you always saw your dad talking down at your mom, your mom talking down at your dad, or people beating up themselves, even in the workplace and all of that. Thank you so much. We're glad to have you back, Engineer Harrison. Um, so we, we're just holding brief and you know looking into some of the conversations. Uh, you, you had the deputy governor speaking of. Uh, Mrs. Eyalini at your meeting at you know at the opening. So we're still looking at how we are progressing. You you had mentioned that the cases may not be rising, but reportage of these issues are getting better. Now, what are some of the guidelines on the uh, Mrs. Patience Zumoyno? What has she brought to the table uh, in terms of how she wants to handle the issue under this administration? Okay, like um, we we have just seen, just one month, she, she wants us to have, um, will I say, an intensive sensitization, mm. if possible. We, we visit churches, we visit schools, we visit markets, anywhere, like you find people gathering. <laughs> if she even has a way, we will do door to door, knock people's houses and inform them that this is not the way to go. And if there is any problem, instead of us to lose a life, you just have to report. And um, let's see how we sort it out. If it's something we go to court, we go. If it's something we, we can resolve amongst the, the, the units, we do that. So she have actually come up with this um, aggressive sensitization and, and method approach so that we can get to the grassroots because there are a whole lot of persons who, who, who may not wake up in the morning and tune into their radios or their television mm. so they can have this information. So that's why we have actually taken this a step further where we get to the churches so that you won't say, oh, uh, I did not hear the uh, over the radio, I didn't watch it on television. But you will go to church on Sunday. So we actually go to church because a whole lot of persons will actually visit the church. We go to the markets where you, probably you will say, uh, I didn't hear in church, I'm, I, I don't like going to church because of one um, offense, one deacon had um, have offended me, so I stopped going to church. We take it to the market, so definitely you won't say, I, 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 I missed the market. You're actually selling there, you're doing one or two things in the market, so definitely we want you to hear this information. So we go on the streets, we, we, we actually do street campaigns too. So that you not say, okay, I wasn't opportune to be in church in the market, but at least you are passing through that street that day. So you definitely heard it. So we want to. She's she's bringing this aggressive and sensitization approach, where we actually take it to everybody, and then when you are informed that this is actually violence, because some men will tell you they didn't even know that beating up their wife is is, mm, is a crime. Not, some people call it yeah. correcting their wife, right? Yeah, they tell you it's my wife. It's my wife. So 
and some women will not take it that um, hitting their husband is a crime. They will tell you, eh, I'm showing him that he's not the only one that has strength and the rest. No, 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 no. So we want to bring this to everybody that see anything that has to do with physical, hitting, psychological, emotional, that all these are crime. And it's punishable by law. Mm. That's the cap. Because probably, okay, it's a crime. Yes, it's a crime. Let's take it as a crime. But when you tell them that, look here, that crime is punishable by law, I think they will have to sit up. Okay, so Angela, let's talk about um, the VAT law a little bit. I, I know that um, the previous administration gave room for that to become a law, uh, the violence against um, persons, uh, you know, in our tribal state. And so far, um, regardless of the law being put in place, the implementation is, seem, you know, somehow lacking behind, or we're lacking behind as a people and as a state in terms of implementation. I remember listening to Professor, I think, um, is it Munji Soledad, the keynote speaker at the kickstarting um, the awareness campaign event and she um, drew our attention to a very critical area now in bringing this message to the people like you've talked about door-to-door -door awareness we oftentimes seem to negate the most important aspect which is the church and then if you also follow the stories and trends of conversation coming from the church you will discover that a lot of people are actually being abused in the church you know even pastors yeah. are abusers themselves so but they hide under the cloak of religion to perpetrate this havoc and so the advocacy of taking these to the church is where i'm coming from what is the plan of the gbv center in terms of creating a lot more awareness about the provisions of the vat law the crime and the punishment and then taking this message to bring in the church and the traditional um, leaders in order to drive this message across board Okay, like um, on Sunday, we had um, some of our team members visit various churches. So we've actually started addressing that issue that has to do with the church. So we have actually taken this last year during our campaigns, we had visited a whole lot, and we are not stopping because we are still doing the same this year. We visited the whole traditional um, institute to let them understand that, see, most of the things you think as your tradition here is a crime. Mm. So how do we address, it? Let, let's partner with the, the, the traditional um, stools to drive this information down. Some, some traditional heads actually did a town hall meeting where they invited other relevant stakeholders within their, their communities and made, us, made them understand that, um, um, look here, these guys have come to actually see how how they modify the way we've been thinking or doing things so the issue of um, the, the 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 widows and all those harmful practices and um, widowhood practices those were were issues we had addressed to the traditional rulers but going to the churches now we actually let them know that um, whatever you're doing within your religious uh, setting you should not violate the state laws because the state laws will hold you responsible and definitely you're going to pay because here we um, if if we if we if we keep them side by side the words in the bible i think the bible say as um, we should just follow peace with all men and holiness so definitely the bible does not provide room for us to actually be fist um fist uh, fistful and actually um, perpetrate um, harm on, uh, on anybody, no matter, regardless of who you are, whether you're the pastor or what. And um, a whole lot of stories that have been making rounds on how pastors are actually um, perpetrators of, um, will I say, rape and the rest. We've actually tried to tell them that the sort does not look at um, who wears the collar. Mm -hmm. Because when, once you've, you've gone against the laws, we're actually going to come in for you regardless of what color of color you're putting on or if, if you're actually using an agbada, we, we don't care. <laughs> so we've actually started going towards that angle. We've, we visited churches on Sunday. We'll still go to more churches and we'll let them know that, look here, this time around, we're not going to spare anybody. Okay. So, so that's great to hear that we are having more integration, especially church-wise and traditionally. 
um, also. But one of the questions I'd like to ask as we bring this you know, conversation to a close is rehabilitation for those people that have been abused. Um, it's usually a problem when you rescue. Uh, we, we also have established that it's hard for you to help someone who doesn't want to be helped. And in the circles of abuse, we see that a lot. Um, the abused does not want to be separated from the abuser. Now, you know, what is the agency doing to help? How do they help to um, re-engineer the mindsets of the abused and reintegrate them back into society? Oh, that's a nice one. We, we, you know, we, we have studied this over time and um, we already know that, you see, it's a psychological thing. The abuser would have made the abuse understand that he is only her savior. So, or his savior, in other ways, because definitely um, the, the name abuser is not, is not gender sensitive. Mm -hmm. Both genders fall into it. So, they make them understand that, oh, I'm only your savior, I'm your safe heaven. So, most times uh, the abuser does not even understand, and the abuse does not even understand that he or she is being abused. So, we, at this other end, we have actually designed what we call safe homes here in the state, we, 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 we have them scattered all around. Some are, are managed by government, some are managed by uh, well-meaning uh, uh, CSOs in the state. So what we do, we pull you out from the abuser and we keep you in the safe home where we now start working on your psychology. You know, this most of these persons have been traumatized. So we, we, we work on them psychologically and we try those who did not have skills because most times it's over dependence that actually makes these persons feel safe in the hands of the abusers. So we try to, to bring up um, skills that would help you, try to groom you up in a way that you can stand on your own independently before we now reintegrate into the society. So we have we got that out long ago. We have created safe homes everywhere around the state where we pull you out, take you to comfort. We try to re-engineer your mind and teach you how the life is supposed to be, not the way you have been seeing it all around. So the safe home is actually a good place for every um, abused person. So we, we have places for kids, we have for teenagers, we have for adults, everywhere in the States. Okay. okay. So we had figured that out long ago. All right, Engineer Arison, before we let you go, I would just like you to ask you this particular question. Now, with the level of awareness measures and, tra and strategies that have been put in place and that has been employed over time, do you think that it has helped in curbing down the GBV violences, I mean GBV cases in the states. Do you think it is effective enough? Because we are still having these cases despite different measures and strategies that have been put in place. Yeah, I would say it has. It has because at the initial, we're actually having issues reporting. People don't actually come out to report. They don't feel safe reporting. You know, like I can shock you now, men are actually reporting that either. Hmm. Like um, we have a case um, which you saw over the internet the other time when a girl damaged everything in her boyfriend's house, his cars and the rest. He had to report, but you 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 would believe that before that time, no man would step out because, for instance, you go go to the police counter and uh, you tell them that look here, uh, this girl did this and did that, or a girl beat me up. They'll just look at you and laugh. But now with, with the, we giving you that avenue of coming to the, the, the GBV you need to report, men now feel safe because they don't, they, when you come, we listen to you, we pay attention, so we don't really call you. So men are now feeling okay. So we believe that firstly, we're having issues, it's only when somebody is late, they beat someone to death. You now come and hear, it. oh, and the husband was beating the wife and she died, or the wife had stabbed the husband and he died. But now we are not hearing those kinds of stories anymore. 
In, in those kinds of cases, do they still prosecute them? Like, you know, at the end of the day, the person is beaten to death, but mm. you now hear from friends and family report. Do you, do you, does the agency still pursue a case there? Is it possible to pursue a case there? Yeah. Why don't we do? Because definitely every life of an acquired woman is our concern. So whether the person did not come to report and had passed away, we still follow the case. Because we definitely need to know. And because, don't forget, whoever beat that person, if it was a man who beat a woman to death, after two years, he will remarry, right? Mm, yeah. True and he will still be against the woman. If it was a woman who stabbed a man to death, she will remarry after five years. Mm. Her sins have been forgiven, like, you know, after every four years, once you change parties, <laughs> your sins are forgiven. So, yeah. after four years, five years, her sins are forgiven, she gets married to another man, she'll still stab him to death. Mm. Over the same, maybe the other man used to tell her, um, see so, she can see so info, and all those things, things that triggered her, right? Mm. Now, this other man did not know, because the other man is late and did not inform him. You didn't give me a <laughs> Unfortunately for him, too, in his happy mood, he may not be saying it aggressively. Mm. He may just come back, he's so happy, and he just she just come and tease him, and he, and he say, that's his own book. And the next thing, he's dead. <laughs> so, we, we take these measures of, um, okay, yes, it has happened. Who is the perpetrator? We get you, please. This is where you can stay for now until your brain is okay mm. to get back to the society. That if you come back to the society. Yeah, and, and, and that, so last, done, that last phrase that you just raised yeah. gives us another question. Whilst they are incarcerated and put away, are they rehabilitation courses that they undergo? You know, after like, three years, they're going to come back. Yes. You know, are you working on them while they're incarcerated? So we shift their psychology. It depends on your friend goes. Okay. If you you know the penalty for death is death mm. or life imprisonment. So it depends on what angle you are coming from. Okay. If it's the one like um, the the lesser like stalking that is in um, three years, we actually talk try to work on your head mm. when you are there and tell you that look here you don't go about invading people's privacy. Do you even know that burning people's um, sensitive materials or destroying people's um, um, household um, properties, mm. documents, that is a crime? Mm. It, it's really good to hear. You don't do it. It's really good to hear this morning. Mm. Yes, it's, we, have, we have a citizen copy where we, you know, you know this issue of um, um, the, the law being too voluminous and the rest. The GBV unit, actually have done a citizen copy where you can glance through. We even have it in Epic, we have it in Pigeon, and we have it in English. So we, we make it so simple that even a child in the nursery school can actually read and understand what is stated in the law. Mm -hmm. So that's how far we've gone. It's, it, it's good to know that we're making progress as a people and we're glad. So in the next one month, we're expecting to see the agency out and about in all parts of the state. And we do hope that this um, activism um, will, will get us the kind of results that we are expecting. All right, Francis, I'll hand the um, engineer Harrison over to you and then we get going. Yeah. Well, I, I, engineer Harrison, just before we let you go, you've touched on a very important um, quite, uh, aspect that I need us to just bring that up. And um, I hope, I, um, uh, um, producer, please get, th there's a picture I need you to get up because I, I, I need to read that word for word. And then you throw more light on this for uh, Quibomites and Nigerians. There's um, a frame, a picture frame here. It says, uh, you do not, or do you know that a person who deprives another person of their freedom by locking them up, hiding or forcefully isolating them from family and friends, commits an offense and will go to prison for two years? Now, that's the question coming from the JBV Center. I'd like you to throw more light on this um, word frame because we've seen instances, even people who are dating, you know, oh, he's my fiance, oh, he's my fiance, she's my fiance, and then people begin to isolate. You can't associate with this person. You can't relate with this person. You can't do this. You can't do that. 
even from families. We've seen people, couples who are married, and I say, since the moment I got married, my husband does not allow my family members to come to a house. It is only his family members. Or my wife does not allow my family members to come. It is only her family members that can come visit us. So throw more light on this, and, and then we'll wrap up the conversation. Okay. Like what you just put up is um, we'll be doing that throughout the month. So we, we've actually, this is actually um, one of the, 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 one of the laws, one of it. So we pick it up every day, what is contained in the bad law, and we, we will be publishing it this way so that people can get to see them. Yeah. Okay. Actually, on this one, when we say you're locking, isolating people, you know, most times, like the examples you cited, Actually, the one the wife say, my husband's people should not come to my house. My wife's people should not come to my house. That one is their internal wall, and I don't know how they take that out. <laughs> because that is locking a way of forcefully isolating them from family. What this law actually means is, for instance, I am married to a woman. And all of a sudden, she goes missing in action she does not none of her family members hear from her they try to inquire from me i can't give them uh, a reason why that is happening they can't reach her they can't talk to her on phone and the rest it's a crime if it is against her wish it is a crime because the woman may choose not to want to relate to her family we won't hold her, that's her personal reasons why she doesn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But where I am the woman, making sure that she does not reach or her family members does not reach her and she does not reach anyone, that's a crime. Because definitely there is something I'm doing to her that I don't want the world to know. Mm -hmm. You see those issues of um, Madame Media Church, your wife is not in church today, you say ah, she's not feeling fine. Mm. One month, she's not feeling fine. She, and she's not pregnant, too, because we know most women hide themselves when they are pregnant. Mm. She's not pregnant, nothing happens. Every Sunday, Madame Idiofa has been what? Uh, she's not feeling fine. Mm. It's either she has a black eye, mm. yeah. or there's something wrong with her somewhere, what you've done, and every Sunday she's not in church. Mm. And so that the, the, world, the church people will not mm. notice. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Engineer Harrison. We, so, we've had quite that's a... Where you okay, I, I, I know that within the course of the month, we are going to have a lot of these conversations. And, and like you said, it's a one-month process, but thank you so much uh, for coming to shed more light on the issues of GBV. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak to mm -hmm. Nigerians, a Kwebomite, and um, the whole world in there this morning. Thank you very much too. We, we we are open for all these conversations. Even after the one month, mm -hmm. you can pull us up. We have this conversation. In fact, this conversation should be a daily conversation because I'm, I'm more concerned about the children and not the, 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 the adults for now because you see, I, I so let me just chip this in. I saw a boy in one school in a kid, a nursery school and every time the teacher would tell me the boy shout on the children in, in the class and all those things. So I got talking with him and I asked him, what's your problem? He said, they talk too much. My daddy says they talk too much. <laughs> so every time he tells, he tells the, the, the female, his female classmate, shut up your mouth. You talk too much. Mm. Before you know it, you have slapped them and all mm. those things. So I was beginning to want to know why this boy is being that brutal and i asked him and he said his dad said mm -hmm. that means his dad have actually been perpetuating this act mm -hmm. and probably he had why do you beat mommy so much and he says she talks That's too much. much women talk too much mm -hmm. so he now has that in his yeah, brain yeah, yeah, yeah. it is there somewhere <laughs> even if that child does not act i've seen people who hate their fathers for beating their mothers but when they grow up, you discover that they start beating their wives yeah. and their girlfriends. And you ask them why. Now, their father may have enshrined this, she talks too much, or they behave like this, like that, like that. Oh, they need, they, need, they need to be disciplined. You understand? So, now that he starts seeing these traces, he now say, oh, I now see why my dad used to beat my mom. Mm. And he now thinks that the best way to shut them up is to actually beat them. 
So these are things, these are conversations we need to keep going every day. We don't just wait till it is the one month awareness, the uh, 16 days activism in November and the rest. So let's make sure it is part of our daily conversation because the work of the media here is also to enlighten the public. And this is a very crucial case we need to bring to the fore. Wow, that's, that's, that's such a touching one that you have raised. We definitely would have this conversation again, especially narrowing it down to um, our children, how we can support abused children and how we can help out. Thank you very much, Engineer Harrison, for coming on the show this morning. Do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Strong conversations and, and children uh, being, you know, they are now victims, especially when you see in cases where you send a child to be a help in someone's house. That's one of the ways we see they're really abused also. Yeah. Um, so we need to be on the lookout for children around us. The last story he just shared is calls for sensitivity on the part of every adult. When you see a child act in a particular way, it, sorry, in a particular way, it's an experience of what they have in the I remember working somewhere and I had this child that was impossible. She was disrespectful to her adults. She was just an impossible child. I recently reconnected with her and because I have an approach to people, I can live with any kind of being. So I worked with her. I was one of the people who would put her to her place, still be nice to her in the midst of it. Over 15 years after we recently reconnected and she was apologizing for what she did so when she was young and thanked me for being the way I was with her. So you need to be able to identify these children, these young adults, teenagers. The, the world is becoming very... We're no longer living as a global village in that sense, you know. So we need to become proponents of looking out for the next person again. It's been a great conversation this morning. Let's take a quick break and rise and shine. Take a breather. When we return, there's a lot more conversations we'll be looking into. What are the papers saying this morning? And we still have an interview segment slated for you this morning. Stay with us. <laughs> 